welcome to Don't Deny the Power TV with Greet the People. Hello everybody. <laughs> Greetings from this household, the Barber household in Stoke-on-Trent. Wonderful. Cedric Barber, Terry Eckersley. I'm going to be continuing the interview with Cedric Barber. Now we're moving into his life and ministry and a ministry called Unite. Cedric. You told me a few things about your upbringing, your work life, you was in the police, you rose to the ranks of sergeant, acting inspector, about your wonderful Christian conversion. And I just want to ask you a little about this current ministry that you're leading and how it first started and happened. How did the ministry of Unite start? The ministry of Unite started about five and a half years ago when Jean and I were saying to each other, what have Christians got to do on a Saturday night? And uh, the answer came back, not very much around here. So we decided to do something about it and put on a Saturday evening meeting with some worship music, with some testimony, and really just a, a general time when people could let their hair down and have a bit of fun. Wonderful. Now, that's great. So it started that way. And how did it develop? What sort of vision came? Because tell me a li little bit about, about the platform vision. Okay. Well, it didn't come straight away. Uh, nobody else was doing it, so we started to do it. And then as we did, we realised what God was having us do. It wasn't just our idea. I had a vision of a platform coming down from heaven. And God was saying to us, all I want you to do is hold up that platform for Jesus to take centre stage. And when Jesus takes centre stage, you will see things happen. One Wonderful, that's great. And what I love about Cedric and his beautiful wife Jean and the great team around them and the people we've met in Stoke is that that's what they've stuck to, that vision. And they've also not only given a platform for Jesus, but they've given a platform for what some people would call emerging evangelists. Um, tell us a little bit about that too. Mm. Okay, well, it's been five and a half years now. And uh, yes, things have changed a little bit over the years. The vision's still the same. The, um, the anointing's still the same. But in this last year or so, I guess, it's accelerated that we've had more people coming to us and saying, we'd like to be part of this. We'd like to minister for you. We'd like to come to Stoke-on-Trent. We'd like to use our gifts there, whether it be evangelists, um, prophets, or just simply giving testimony. People have shown a great interest in coming to us. And it's expanded our circle of influential people in the kingdom. And uh, really, it's, it, it's just exploded in the last 12 months or so in terms of people coming to us. It's wonderful and Jean and Cedric have got a unique ministry with Unite because they work with the local church, they want to see the local churches working together in unity, that's a bit novel. <laughs> anyway, but that is just great how they're working across denominations with evangelists and other Ascension Gift Ministries to see Jesus, central to a platform, and through that lives are getting changed. Tell us a little bit about some of the lives that have been changed. The very first meeting that we had, we tried to keep outside of churches, tried to keep it neutral, and it was actually in a factory. Mm. It was in a room in a factory. A church did meet there on a Sunday because it was a Christian owner, but we felt keep out of churches and uh, invite friends along, get somebody to give the testimony, and on that particular evening at the end, a boy of eight gave his life to Jesus. We never made any appeal or anything. This was after the event had finished. And we felt that that was the Lord's stamp of approval on, on our meetings. So that's how we started. From there, we did start to see a lot of healing. We did see people get saved. And the, it just moved on and on. Of late, we've been connected with more evangelists and more people with powerful ministries who've come along and we've seen more people get saved. Um, the, probably the last local meeting that we had was here in uh, Stoke-on-Trent in a town hall. Four people were saved, a number of people were healed um, and we've seen some amazing things. God has worked through the platform that we've been able to put on. You mentioned a platform. Um, that was the platform that God gave us as a platform coming down from heaven for Jesus to take centre stage. Uh, I don't have to do anything very special apart from put the platform on, which means booking the hall or church, uh, speaker, inviting people to come along. And that's my job as a pillar, 
holding up that platform. Wonderful, that's great. And Jill and I have been privileged to do a number of events with you. I know we've done one at Lytham St Anne's. Mm. We've done one at the Methodist Hall in Stoke. The Methodist Hall in Stoke? Yes, the uh, Longton mm. Central Hall. The Longton yeah. Central Hall. And we're here this weekend doing a breakfast meeting. Then we're doing an evening meeting on a Saturday, the ones they do. And then we're doing a Sunday meeting as well. Um, working with a local church. What's the name of the church? It's called the Grace and Faith Victory Church in Kidsgrove. There you go, Grace and yeah. Faith Victory Church. And Cedric is a member of a local Assemblies of God church, that's is that right? right? Yes, that's You've got a new pastor, Tell the people. Have. The new pastor is Mark and Liz Holcroft, a married couple who were in the 30s. Uh, they were members of that church 10 years ago, and then they've been missionaries in Slovakia. Wonder 10 years. I'm looking, back. I'm looking forward to meeting them so much. Mm. And just share a bit of, in closing now, because um, we've got a local Methodist church that we attend just across from where we live. And I love John Wesley. I love uh, Whitfield. Um, I, I quote them in, in my book, same as the TV series, Don't Deny the Power. And, and some unusual and exceptional things are happening in the UK at the moment through the Methodist movement mm. that I haven't told Gene and Cedric yet, but I will do. I might tell you guys on another one. But um, tell us a little about the Methodist movement and the primitive Methodists. Where we live in, in this part of Stoke-on-Trent, which is uh, North Staffordshire, um, Methodism is very strong. Uh, John Wesley came to Burslem, the mother town of Stoke-on-Trent, back in the 1700s. The miners from this area then walked down to Bristol, to, hit, to one of his churches in Bristol, to get ideas. They walked back again to Stoke-on-Trent. It's quite a distance, probably... It's probably 100 miles or more, probably 120 miles, and uh, they established Swan Bank Methodist Church, which is there in Burslem now, one of the more progressive Methodist churches. But uh, John Wesley's time was wonderful, uh, revival, uh, and of course for that, for his pains, he got excommunicated, as it were, from the um, Anglican Church, holding meetings in the open air. And uh, this was for ordinary people, and this is what he believed God wanted him to do. To bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to ordinary people so that's how it happened camp meetings and one of the most famous camp meetings of all time was held about three miles three miles from here at Mount Cop where there is a castle on the hill which you can see from the M6 wow. as you go by thousands of people hearing the word of God <coughs> and making decisions for Jesus wonderful let me just come in there because a lot of people including myself thought camp meetings originated in America in the Great Awakening mm. and then of course Kenneth Hagin started doing meetings after that camp meetings and of course Dr Rodney Howard Brown camp meetings but I'm amazed to hear that well it, it was an import really because there was a man called Lorenzo Dow oh. the, a very famous American a rather eccentric man long black hair down his back rather like a modern day Bill Bill Wilson would be a modern day Lorenzo Dow mm. and uh, he came over took part in a lot of these camp meetings here and uh, that's the way it was in Wesley's day. Wesley died in the early 1790s and very very shortly after his death the Methodist conference decided that the camp meetings were rather infra dig and they were not what they wanted. But it should be maybe, said. Maybe they wanted to be seeker friendly. It maybe they wanted people to wear skinny jeans with rips in and <laughs> have smoke machines. I, I I'm think, teasing, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. In today's way of looking at it, yes, but there was to be peer pressure on them. Yeah, maybe we'll have to serve them lattes <laughs> made out of soy milk and give them hot cross buns and donuts and forget all the power of God and the healings and the mighty move and holiness. Well, yeah, the motivation was the same, but I think the cause of it all was at the time there'd been a revolution in France. Yes. And in this country, the government was very keen that that shouldn't happen. Yes, but Wesley, they, they say that if the Wesley's hadn't been risen up, mm. we, we were on the verge of having a revolution yeah. in yeah. the UK. That's what they said. That's, but that's what stopped it. It stayed yeah. the plague yeah. off the land. Respected historians say that, and, and I believe that as of well. Of course. Um, but after he died, the Methodist uh, Conference decided otherwise, saying, no, this is not what we're doing. We, this yes. isn't and I think it was to appease government that there was nothing yes. out of control going on, as or, or seemed to be out of control. Yes. So, but isn't that a tragedy? Because I know that Wesley's greatest fear was that he'd leave behind a church mm. when he went to heaven. Yeah. 
and it would have a form of godliness but deny the, deny power. the power. And yeah. that's what they that's did right. at that very yeah. conference. Yes. Are you leading to something there, Terry? No, I'm not leading to anything, but it's interesting, interesting that we're talking about this. But I'm leading to. So what did the primitive Methodists then do? They went and took the power. Yes, they did. They didn't deny the power, Terry. They that's took great. the power. And they they did what was they called themselves primitive but getting back to basics back, back to basics out in the open air i think i'm a primitive methodist <laughs> yeah me too are you one yes. as well yes I've are you a primitive methodist <laughs> come on now pentecostals are reborn primitive methodists <laughs> amen um so yeah they went out and did it and uh, william Clowes, hugh Bourne came along and they carried on with the camp meetings and for that they were kicked out of the methodist church and they started the primitive primitive methodist movement Primitive Methodist Church in 1811. It's, it's wonderful, this history lesson, because history dictates that often the last move of God becomes an old wineskin mm. and they oppose vehemently and even persecute mm. the new move of God yes. Yes. and criticise. Yes. And religion and tradition goes after the anointing, wants to kill it. It's a pattern but how can you kill, being repeated. How can it? you kill the anointing? You can't. And... Uh, the, the other explanation is that every time God builds another story on his house, yes. the first thing that the move of God does after it's settled down is to put the roof on. And when the next move of God comes along, the first thing that happened is that the roof gets blown off. Yes. And the last ones are the most opposed to the next move. That's the way history is taught. Wow. Well, isn't that a fascinating history story that goes all the way back to Pentecost? Mm. So I pray the Lord Jesus blows off the roofs off our houses yes. spiritually because we've just had some big winds here in the uk three tiles off next door yeah but you know what i'm saying yeah that god will blow one more time through his church in the uk and not just through his church but across the land mm. Mm. we're going i'm very excited because among with Cedric and many others in the UK that we're connected to, we're going to be holding Don't Deny the Power meetings. Don't Deny the Power tour is here in the UK. So get ready for the dates coming up. We're going to be doing some stuff with Cedric and other friends and connections across the UK. And we're going to be hiring buildings. Just like we mentioned them before, the Jeffries brothers did. Mm. We'll even have camp meetings. Yeah, that would be novel, wouldn't it? That would be very novel in the UK. Um, so if you want to get involved in this, if you want to host one or be around one, because they're going to be across denominational, we're going to be going for people who don't come to church, who are not Christians, in many, many cool, brand new ways, just contact us, message me, email me, you can get in touch with me. If people want to be in touch with Unite, mm -hmm. how do they find you? Cedric. We have a website. Um, which Tell is the people. www.christiansunite.org.uk um, That's probably the best way to get us. So for any meetings that Cedric's doing, you can go to? www.christiansunite.org.uk Yeah, you've got that. And Cedric, like myself, is across all the social media platforms, especially Facebook. You're on a lot, aren't you? Yes, sometimes YouTube as well. Sometimes <laughs> YouTube, especially his wife. Jean, she's on Facebook a lot. But anyway, and if you're a speaker, I know the book took quite a lot in advance, but just contact them. Don't hassle them. Just send your details. Tap on the door. You don't need to keep kicking it. Anyway, we love you. So don't deny the power TV from... Cedric? From... Cedric at Unite. Terry Eckersley and Joe, we love you so much. Ciao for now. Don't deny the power. <laughs>